there we are hello you all first money making people out there i'm avaldas and i'm a passionate liberty minded fellow just like you and host of a uh, first new uh, idea lab an event that sprung uh, out of a cycle idea so we had in you know, a discussion on mentoring and main thing you learn today is how to make a profit by selling on ebay this lessons will be done in three parts so firstly i'd like to introduce our guest roger key serling hi Roger. that was pretty good <laughs> how are you today roger i'm doing just great doing just great excited to be on your show today are you ready to teach uh liberty me community some few tricks how to make money on ebay <laughs> sure um we want to make a profit so uh let me start off on ebay you can make profit on items that you might not make profit on on other platforms like amazon especially um used or thrifted items i think they do better on ebay than amazon i don't sell thrift items though i sell new products on ebay which is a little more difficult because I compete with a lot of Amazon sellers who tend to have more drop shipping, which I don't even do. I buy my products and I resell them. That's the difference. If I were to sell on Amazon, I would just drop ship everything. I would not invest in anything. I would either drop ship it or send it off to FBA. I wouldn't have massive shipping projects to do. It would require much less of my time. I'd probably even make more sales, but my profit margin is less because I'm competing with everybody on a single page. But on eBay, I have a little bit more options. When someone calls up one of my items, they're actually just looking at my item. And then down at the bottom, they have a few other ones that they can see that the computer pulls up, normally priced higher than mine. So I have a little bit of advantage on the individual looker that's already looked for my item on scoring that sale. The way you make a profit out of it is if the price on the network for an item is $10, okay? Like you can go to Amazon, you can get it in three days if you place an order over $25. Prime, for $10, you can get that item in three days. Well, to do that on eBay is a little more tricky because if they only buy the one item and you want to get it to them in three days, you're paying priority shipping on a single item. The way to compete with Amazon is to get them that item fast. My sellers come back to me on eBay over and over and over again, and they pay a little bit more on some things because they know when they order my eBay item, they're going to get it in two or three days, even if it's a $10 or a $15 item. Now, you don't make money on that sometimes. For example, you sell a book. Book is heavy. You can't mail it first class. So you're going to have to mail that book in a padded envelope. With your discount, you're looking at a minimum of $5. And that's in the little paper cardboard envelope, not really the way you should ship. It should be in an envelope or a box, you know, something very well protected. So you're talking about 6 or $7. Now, if I'm selling something for $9.99 and it's costing me 6 or $7 to mail it off, that means I had to make all of my money in the few dollars that are left after fees. Now, the only way you can do that is if you didn't spend hardly anything for the item at all, or you can get your buyer to buy more than one item. And that's how I do my cheap stuff that doesn't make me any money. That's how I turn a profit. I'll list that book for $10 and then they'll buy it. But I have a promotion. If they buy two more things, they get 10% off. Doesn't matter what the cost of the other items are. Well, after a short time, buyers figure out, I can buy a $20 item and two little $10 items. Well, I'm basically almost getting that one last $10 item for free and I'm getting it all sent to me priority. Well, that's when you make your profit because everything is going in one box, one $7 shipment for three items instead of a $10 item that costs you $7 to mail out that you don't make any money. So that's one way you can make money is have loss leaders with fast shipping that can compete. 
Now, not everyone can afford to do that because to do that, you have to have volume. So, sorry, Roger, to interrupt you. Uh, it seems that people are saying we are a little bit lagging in the broadcast. <laughs> ah. So maybe you could try using your phone instead. Okay, so why don't uh, you do a little filler and I will swap and then we're going to hear some nasty echoing for a second until I click off, okay? All right. <laughs> All right, so, give me just a second. No problem. So instead of... Uh, Getting back to Roger and his details about how to do it like provision on eBay. I actually would like to share something that one of our community members, uh, Brian, uh, has told me how he actually does it. And it's actually a pretty interesting story. That was my second part I want to go over, but we'll have a sort of a, switch it a little bit so you can. You won't have to wait for Roger to get back. So, Brian's story, which was very interesting to me because it shows that making money is really can be as simple as just putting something as a PTA file on a CD and selling on eBay. And that's uh, really profound because I normally, if someone else would tell me that uh, you can make money like that, uh, I would be. Uh, really skeptical about it but uh, once Brian told me what kind of uh, money he's making uh, he still is like it's uh, just pocket money but uh, it's actually pretty good and you compare total with everything and compared to the time you have to you have to spend uh, I think it's worth a trouble so let me go over uh, like three cases that uh, that uh, I want to share so, and first case, and it was like, uh, I think I started 2004. Basically, Brian bought by accident an uh, old military manual's box on sale. And that box uh, contained some mounted problem manuals that uh, are not available anywhere else. And we're actually pretty well valuable to some people. And because of that, he put them uh, on eBay and sold one manual just over $100, which he said himself blew him away. And uh, after he started talking to some of the sellers, buyers, and uh, we start asking him why he doesn't just do a photocopy on those manuals and sort of make it more available to more people. And that's, that's what he did. He basically just scanned those manuals and put them on CDs, uh, which uh, one one place you could say that uh, it is a some copyright infringement, but it actually isn't because it's uh, owned by government and he owns the photocopies, so it sort of worked out like that. And basically, just put them on eBay. And in just 2006, 2007, as I wrote here, he made over $8,000 dollars just from selling the CDs and in the past three years we the sale has gone down as he said and he just, just made like two thousand three thousand dollars but in terms of uh, how many hours and effort required to do, <laughs> do this I would say this is quite a pretty good money and uh, as we had like yesterday's talk uh, of course about investments and uh, what Tick told that you have to be cap uh, you have to have capital to actually be a capitalist and to make those investments. And if you're thinking you don't have enough capital and you might want to do something simple, doing something like just selling that actually you know where's the market in can be quite lucrative at least for star starters. So. And one other thing that really struck me well uh, it's uh, that he didn't have to do any kind of marketing and uh, any special promotions, basically, because the product was pretty much in demand and it was a niche product. Sellers were looking for him themselves, and it sort of positioned him in pretty good <laughs> place on eBay. That he, and that's why he could make that, that kind of money. So the next case 
and he told me about is basically just selling uh, tomato seeds, which <laughs> also might be doesn't sound very fancy or attractive, but uh, who cares if you can make money money out of it? So uh, one of his friends bought some heirloom heirloom seeds. Uh, Okay, Brian just told me about the copper, I think, <laughs> who was in the chat. So the next case is uh, about uh, tomato seeds. Also interesting and I would say like uh, just do it yourself type of sell. So one of his friends uh, basically bought some tomato seeds on eBay and told him about it. And he is he's also a farmer, he lives in a farm. He knows how to grow things, and uh, he knows actually how to grow the seeds. And for that, he had this idea: Why shouldn't I grow my seeds myself and try to put it on eBay? Or another idea would be just buy those seeds in bulk from different suppliers and package them, and basically make a profit uh, just from the margins. You buy like in bulk volume, and you sell small, smaller quantities. And what he did is actually put his those 25 seeds in one. Uh, actually, he advertised 25 seeds, but put uh, like 30 in a package. It sort of uh, gives a little bit more value to a customer, and it turned out also pretty well. Since 2009, <laughs> a figure is $30,000, which uh, just for growing seeds, which uh, you have like almost zero cost. <laughs> I would say it's pretty pretty good value. And uh, sort of a last case uh, is honey. Actually I'm also a big fan of honey and I had some ideas about selling it but I never took it uh, <laughs> to that level as Brian. So uh, Brian is also a beekeeper too so he, he has uh, probably multiple bee houses and where he can extract honey each year and uh, the benefit of using this kind of approach is that he, the cost is also pretty minimal I mean I'm not an expert on this but uh, I would expect that uh, you have some initial capital investment but uh, in terms of uh, ongoing costs it's probably maintenance and uh, being a sort of expert on your knowledge and you are basically not tied too much of being like 24 like uh, five to um, five days a week eight hours every day you just have to make sure that uh, these are working for you and the results are also pretty good actually very interesting that you can sell about eight for honey for 18,000 a year which is about 3,000 pounds of honey and from my experience what I know back in Lithuania, where I lived, some beekeepers can make uh, like even 10,000 10, pounds or more depending on uh, how we approach the beekeeping. But in terms of uh, return, on, return on investment, you basically invest one time in your farm and then you can just uh, uh, take the profits every year. I mean, as long as you know what you're doing. <laughs> so. To conclude this case is, uh, I think that basically what I would say is if you can find just a niche which you think there's a market for and ensure that you can be profitable in it, there's no, and there's quite little capital or basically no capital investment, where it's pretty easy to try it out and just see if it works or not and if you gain traction, why not try to do it. So that's like a short story from Brian and now we're gonna back to Roger's talk. So Roger, are you here? Yeah, can you hear me all right? Yeah, I can hear you and let's see if folks at Liberty Me are hearing. Not too much of a delay I hope in sound. Yeah. Okay. 
So did you want me to, to continue? Yeah, yeah, everything's good. So let's right. continue. Well, I thought that was very interesting about the tomatoes. Really? Uh, Maybe yes. you can start touch on a on few points because I'm interested in your opinion as you doing this yeah. profession. So what I would do uh, if I had the tomato, actually, I have a farm and I raise bees myself too, by the way. But oh, I don't nice. Them. Uh, but if I were to do the tomato seeds like he was doing, I think that's a great idea. But what I would do with that one of the things I have found as a rather large seller, as an anchor store on eBay, is I have a lot of repeat buyers. And that is kind of what cements me into making a profit and not losing money when the market goes up and down. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, part of the reason for that is when a buyer comes to my store, if they wanted to buy tomato seeds like your friend is selling, they would see the tomato seeds and they would buy those. They'd see my promotion. They see they want to get a few more things to save a little bit of money. I would have the tomato seeds, the markers for the tomato seeds, the tie backs to tie up the vines, the cages that the tomato seeds grow in, uh, aprons, knee pads for people who are gardeners, gardening tools, hoes, rakes. The list will just keep going on and on and on. If the primary of my target was to sell those tomato seeds everything else that i bought would aim at buying the tomato seeds or aim at after you bought the tomato seeds what else would i buy and what's so funny is i actually kind of did that but not with tomato seeds i did it with a gardening house you know the winter gardening kits that you can buy yeah and one experience for like 30 bucks uh cost 40 to ship it I make absolutely no money when I sell it for $100. But everyone that has bought one of my little winter greenhouses that I don't make any real money on has also bought pots and markers and insulation stripping. And uh, I don't sell the potting soil, but I had considered that at one time. <laughs> but that's it just not lucrative. But... Basically, everyone that has bought one of those greenhouses has spent an additional two or three hundred dollars buying other products that I have to go in the greenhouse. Even a little greenhouse heater I carried at one time. So, just to be clear, this this term is called upselling, right? Upselling, upselling, and they do it to themselves. Buyers do it themselves. If you provide a very good price on everything in your store and some sort of little deal, if they buy more than one, any kind of deal. Uh, shipping discount, free shipping if they buy more than one. All my stuff's free shipping, but uh, a discount on price or certain percentage if they spend over a certain dollar amount. Anything to encourage them to look at doing that next purchase. But that's not all. You have to make sure that if you're going to encourage them to do the next purchase, well, you've got something worth them buying. So, for example, your tomato seeds. If I was in a store and I was shopping online and I was looking for tomato seeds and I saw a super good deal on one package of tomato seeds in a store, I'd buy that one package and then I'd move on to another store to look for the stuff to go with it. But if I was in that store and I saw those same tomato seeds that I just saw a moment ago for maybe 20 or 30% more cost, but in that same store, I could buy pots to put them in, the tie backs or whatever else I wanted to go with them or other seed packets and get a little bit of a discount on the multiple purchase, that's where I'm going to shop because I know for a fact that I only have to wait for one package to come in the mail. I'm not having to wait for a package of seeds, wait for a package of pots, wait for a package of something else to come from another seller. So just by preference of convenience, and a little bit of a lure of discount, you just landed three sales instead of three individual buyers getting the sale. And your main thing that you were pushing was the seeds that they wanted in the first place. How, how much do you see customers uh, like attracted to that kind of uh, upsells? Is it percentage-wise? Could you maybe tell? 30% of my sales are repeat buyers and people using my sale promotion. That's a rather high percentage from what I understand from other sellers. Most people, their percentage about 15 to 20%. Uh, 
uh, take advantage of promotions and sales in their store. Uh, uh, those are the ones that I know that at least keep the statistics. Some may be higher, some may be lower. Now, the reason mine is a little bit more successful is because I market that I do that. Uh, you can look at my pages on Instagram, Twitter, all the different social sites, and you'll see a collage picture. I'm going to use tomato seeds. That's not real in my store, but I'll use that as an example. If I had the tomato seeds in the pots and the tiebacks like I was just discussing, you'd look on Instagram. There would be a really interesting picture with some neat graphics that shows all four or five products that people may buy together. I'd put a little caption at the top, welcome to Key Webco, buy three, get 10%, buy five, get 15%, check out our millions of items or thousands of items or some other little kitsch phrase, post that on to social media. If I, it's a major product line, like uh, if I was carrying 100,000 packages of tomato seeds, 20,000 pots or whatever, then I would put a Facebook ad on that. And that's what really makes a difference. You can run a very tiny Facebook ad for five or six dollars for a day or two. Put a multiple pictures of four or five items that you're selling as a group or put a promotion on those particular items. Run that little ad on Facebook for five or six dollars just for the weekend. If you get at least five or six click throughs, probability is at least one of those click throughs purchases those items that you put up. Now, you have to do the math. If you spend five or six dollars on an ad and then you're sending out those items, you have to make sure that your profit margin allows for that ad cost. I base mine on a single sale. Now, my ads do way better than that. Uh, I can run an ad and get 30, 40 sales off a single $5 ad, but I have established my social media presence. A new seller can't do that. A new seller needs to plan on one ad, one sale. Now, when the results change, you adjust your budget. Does that make sense? <laughs> yeah, yeah, really good stuff. So do you do any like calculations? How, how much does it cost for, per customer? Is it all a little bit, but like, uh, do you track if a customer is repeated? And do you slice like a budget? Yeah. That? That's actually a more more of a, a work time budget than a cost budget. Right. For example, I keep accurate records. I mean, extremely accurate records of every single email communication, every single transaction, every single re repeat transaction. I use GoDaddy software to help me with that, but it's still pen and paper. Uh, when I start noticing a screen name appear in my database two or three times, that screen name gets a file in a card index. Every time they purchase, I look them up, I mark it. After I see that they've made four or five purchases, I send them a little email with a coupon code. Hey, spend 50 bucks, send me an email, you get it for 50% off. Or enter this coupon code, you'll get 50% off your next order no matter what it is. And that's a loss leader coupon. Uh, there's no way I make a 50% profit on a $5 or $10 item. But I basically am letting them have that item for free and shipping. But not one of them has come back to my store and bought just my one little loss leader for 50% off. They're not going to buy just one item at 50% off. They buy three or five to get the 50% off coupon I gave them, plus the 10% they get as a built-in feature in my store. Now, I just turned that 50% loss coupon into a minimal profit, even with it being 60 or 65% off because they've bought three to five to 10 items. As a matter of fact, I just sent out one of those coupons last week. The buyer bought 25 items for me. It was a $500 purchase. They got that for 60% 60 60 off. <laughs> nice marketing. I mean, I'm not sure if it's a secret to you, but maybe you can share how much uh, money on a monthly basis can anyone, like, uh, on, our, on average, make just by doing full-time eBay, if we are serious. It depends. Uh, it depends on what you're peddling. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> 
You know, uh, I have everything from five ninety nine. I think the most expensive thing in my store right now is only one hundred and fifty dollars. I mean, that's cheap. That's dirt cheap. Uh, but I have twenty eight hundred items, and every day I can barely get them all to the post office in time. I sell so much. So, you know, uh, I can't really tell you how much they can make. I can tell you that I do very well. I make a lot of money. All right, <laughs> that's fair enough. <laughs> do you also maybe a more like interesting question? Do you do like an email list? You you told like you resell, resending uh, discounts to your customers back. So you well, I don't. Uh, I kind of do with my little tracking that I do, where I watch if a buyer has bought a certain number of items, and then I send them the coupon. I don't do active eBay mailing uh, except for what eBay generates automatically. Uh, other sellers that I know are doing that and with some success too. I just haven't tried it yet and that is on my list to do. But yes, I would recommend that. Uh, don't spam your buyers because you won't have any buyers. But uh, if, you, if you send out a respectful email on a not too often basis, uh, that has got great graphics, give them some sort of coupon code or discount to make it worth their time to read. Yeah, I think email marketing is a very good way to go. I don't do it, but I I'm not going to not recommend it. I just don't do it. Uh, but I would say it is a good thing to look into. I haven't done it yet, though. Uh, but uh, on the same, it works the same as social media, in my opinion. I much rather have someone interact with me instantly then send them an email wondering if they're going to read it. Because if you can get someone to write a comment in your post on social media, you have just been given a red carpet walkway to make that sale because they've already engaged you. Once a buyer has engaged you, you can communicate with them and that's all you need. And do you like uh, re reply all to your comments and do you ask something? Or how much does it lead to sales? Can you say that again? Do you interact directly in, via, via Facebook, and uh, how much does it lead to sales? Where, like, comment okay, wise? Well, yeah, it does. Uh, that's a hit and miss thing. Uh, I also, well, we're we're really talking about eBay, but a little off subject. Uh, I have selling groups on Facebook where people take their eBay, Amazon, whatever kind of item. They post it in our social selling groups, which are public. And the group members all share those items to their social networks. And then they post their own. Uh, so basically, it's a, a way for everyone to post an item and have it get marketed. Now, the advantage to that is great because not only when you post something in the group where people can buy it directly, uh, other members are sharing it to their pages, so you're getting eyes on your prize that you would not normally get. You're getting exposure to buyers that don't look, look at your pages. They look at somebody else's. So in that respect, you can exponentially grow your reach. And seeing the products and interacting with the buyers is how you make all of your sales. Finding your items in SEO or search order uh, is is the other way. If you do those two things together, there's really no limit on how much you can sell, no matter what platform you're selling on. doesn't matter if you're eBay, Amazon, Estes anymore. Uh, this is the e-commerce generation. It's not the Amazon generation, the eBay generation. Everybody's selling on a multiple platforms. The trick is making sure that no matter what platform you use, you provide a better value than the item sitting right next to it in search. Either by the description being better, the image being better, your shipping speed being better, your price being better, the choices that you have in your store being better. Uh, I don't niche uh, sell on eBay, which is recommended, meaning that I'll sell anything A to Z. I don't care what it is. It's all new in the package, but it's A to Z. Any product. So I don't get advantage of someone looking for, let's say, tomatoes, planting, gardening. If someone's just looking for gardening, my store is not, it'll come up, 
but it's not going to come up in the top of search because I am not focused just on gardening. But if I have 400 gardening items, yeah, it's going to come up because I have just as many gardening items as a niche store. So what it requires for me to do is have a lot of choice and products to compete. All right. No, seems seems smart what you do. Um, but uh, do you have to invest a lot of money to start out? I mean, if you have almost, as you said, 3,000 items, how much one would need to start out, like doing a little bit more professionally well, than just something? <laughs> <laughs> That's a tricky question. I'll tell you the truth. I started in 2012. I had 10 items, some leftover Barbies that didn't sell on Amazon when I used to sell there that were, were worth a lot of money. So I took the 10 Barbies, I sold them on eBay, and I bought a bunch of clothes, used clothes, thrift store, dirt cheap. Half of them I had to toss out because they were no good. The ones that were good, I washed, I cleaned up, I made some good listings, I put them all on eBay. If you look at my store now, there's almost no clothing whatsoever. But that's what paid for it all. I sold all the clothes, I sold the 10 little dolls that I had, and I reinvested every single penny. I did. I wasn't working full-time eBay then. It was a sideline hobby. And the way I invested it is I went to clearance aisles. I found a, it was almost Christmas time when I was doing this. I found a clearance for 90% off on a whole bunch of radio control cars, really junky ones. I mean, the bottom of the barrel. But I got them for $3 a piece. They were worth $25 a piece online. And I only had one return, so not too bad. I sold 200 of them. Every single penny from those cheap little cars went right back into eBay. And it just happened to be the beginning of November. So Christmas was rolling around. So you know what I did? I went out and instead of buying the 90% cheap old junk already radio control cars, I bought five of the best radio control cars that money could buy. I put a ridiculously high price on them. It was Christmas time, and I got my ridiculously high price. That's what paid for everything. I took every penny that made, and for the next six months, the only thing I bought was clearance items that I could get for 90%, 75% off. I put everything I got my hands on in the store with a minimal profit, and I didn't drain anything out. I did that for a year. I went from 12, 20 listings to an anchor store in a year and a half. And that's 1,500 listings in a year and a half. So and basically, nothing. Because everything I made, I just rolled right back in. Now, I wasn't living on that money for the first year. So it depends on your restrictions. If I needed the money from my eBay store like I do now, I live on my eBay earnings now. I couldn't have done that because I would have had to been draining out money to buy food and pay the rent and everything else. But you can do that on a small scale. I now, every item that goes out the door has a percentage for loss, that means returns, has a percentage for the packaging material that it costs to put it in, has a percentage for the fees and everything, that's what everyone already knows, the fees, the PayPal fees, the, um, uh, damage fees, I have a percentage that I figure for damage. That's mistakes I make. For example, you go up on a ladder, you're going getting a whole rack down of glasses. Someone bought 12 in a box. You fall off the ladder. Well, where's the money coming from to pay for those 12 things that you have to refund? And the loss. So every product that I have has a 1% loss on it. And it's calculated in. Every penny that comes in 1% of that money I put aside for loss on that item in my budget. So do you actually calculate the margins you're getting, I mean, on average for your item? Are you make up from your upselling or which items makes you most of a profit? Hmm. Uh, the most profitable items are ones that are bought in multiple purchases and cheap because of volume. Now, that's not a recommendation for most sellers. Uh, your most profitable item will be the item that you got for the least amount of money that you did the best job marketing and listing. 
that's going to be your most profitable item every time. Uh, if you're asking for, in my case, <laughs> you're going to laugh. Uh, I think my most profitable item was a dictionary that I made 25 cents a piece on, but I sold 350 of them. That was my most profitable item. Did, did it went out fast? <laughs> yeah, just boom, all gone. <laughs> nice. Yeah. But that's not that's not really a way to to to, to form your business. Uh, when you're trying to look at what is going to be profitable, it's an equation: demand, quality, competition. That's going to tell you what's going to be the most profitable. If it's a high demand item, you get a couple points for that. If there's not very much competition for p other people selling that item, you get a couple points for that. Mm -hmm. And if the item that you have is the best quality one or the least quality one with the best price, you get points for that. So really there's no solid answer. And there's really no solid answer for anybody. Everything is an equation of what works for your business. For example, mm -hmm. I would not be a good one to be selling bridal gowns. You wouldn't look at my dragon logo in my store and my 99 mm -hmm. cent store mm -hmm. items and my uh, mm -hmm. back to school items and think, oh, this is exactly where I want to buy my wedding dress. <laughs> okay? So that wouldn't be a profitable item for me. But you know, if I put my dragon in a bridal gown with a veil in my graphics and I had artificial flowers for sale and other products that looked more like a bridal gown shop, well, that same dress that I could list in my store now and never sell, I might make a profit on. So there really is no true equation that you can give anybody because there are so many variable factors. The best thing to do is think about what is the buyer going to want how are they going to find it? Start your title with the words that they would be looking for to find it. That will help you more than anything. And if you go back a little bit to the supply and actually demand side, when you think about what to sell on eBay, how do you put in that equation what is the demand and can you actually meet, meet the demand and make, I mean, make, make those sales? Okay, well, that, that's a good question. Um, what I do is when I go into the store, let's say I'm at Walmart. I'm in the clearance aisle. They're selling tablecloths. If you look at my store, that's where all my tablecloths came from. I have hundreds. Uh, I got them for 50% off. They were an expensive tablecloths to begin with. This isn't junk. So what you do is you take your phone out and you scan that barcode. If you scan it on eBay, you're wasting your time because they never come up. So scan it on Amazon and see what um, items come up, okay? If you see that that very item that you just barcode scanned has 50 sellers on Amazon, the price is about what it is on the package at Walmart, chances are you're not going to do very good with it on eBay uh, because there's 50 sellers on Amazon. You can get it in three days and... There's just too much competition. Then I look up, then I copy and paste the title from somebody's Amazon listing into Google search. I look if eBay items come up in Google search. I ignore eBay's platform completely when I'm researching because my goal is to get it all on Google. So if it comes up on Google search and I see there's one or two eBay sellers that have it, I'll click on their listings. If their listings are crap, I buy it immediately. If their listings are great, I'll look at their price. If I can undersell them, I'll buy it immediately. If I can't undersell them and their listings are good, I ignore the item altogether. I don't even mess with it. But if I look at their listing and the photos aren't very good or they don't have all the item specifics or their UPC code is missing, I buy it in a heartbeat. Because all I have to do is add that UPC, make a little bit better keyword, a little bit better picture, and mine's going to come up and search first. And that's the one that gets bought. So I don't have to worry about the bad listing. That's how I judge what's going to be competitive. It's all about what's out there at that moment. I ignore seasons. I don't pay any attention to if it's Christmas or Halloween or any of that. The only way I pay attention to that is what's in clearance after it's over.
<laughs> and as soon as I buy it, I list it. I listed Christmas cards. I listed 200 Christmas cards the day after New Year's. I've been selling one or two a week <laughs> since New Year's. I only paid 10 cents a box for those cards. I'm selling them for eleven ninety nine. So basic idea is you you don't actually know when you're going to sell that item. The idea is just awesome. that you want to... Uh, I do do targeted listing, though. Uh, for example, when I hit clearance, look, I'll give the Christmas cards. I bought 12 banker boxes full of Christmas cards. I listed five of them online now. The other ones are sitting there waiting for November to re-stimulate the ones that I've already done that are online and to add new listings just going into the fall season. So in a respect, yes, I do watch what market trends are, but not for what I'm going to buy or purchase or when I list the item initially. I hold back a certain percentage of what I buy to list targeted. For example, what I mean is if I have five boxes of banker cards, I might list four of them and keep one of them back. The one that gets put back, I write a date on it. Normally, I just put Xmas November. That means before November is over or right when November starts, these are Christmas products that I need to list. Now, what happens when you do that? Everything that you had already listed is indexed. It's in your store. You have a few sales on them. But they've been dropping down for about six seven months because they're older listings. Every time something renews, it gets put up to the top and it drops way back down to the bottom faster and faster every time if there's no activity on it. So how do you get activity on it? You make it important again. So November rolls around. I'll take that one box of Christmas cards that I have left. I will list them all brand new, splicing off my old listings. Mm -hmm. Then I go back to those old listings that have not sold. I rearrange the titles a little bit. I might rearrange the pictures, maybe add a few more, add a little bit more to the description, maybe check, change the text size if I made the text 10 point instead of 14, whatever corrections I can. If I see that it's a really dead card and nobody's even looked at the traffic in a year, then I make it a lot of 10 and I totally change the listing altogether. And I do all this in one day, the day I list those new products at the beginning of November. You know what happens? Sometimes those new products sell a few, but what starts clicking off are those old ones that have been indexed for months and months and months that have now become redone. So they become, they get a boost for being redone. They appear at the top again. And then you've got fresh activity on that product line. When you have activity on a product line, they all get linked together by the bots. So in search, if someone types in Christmas cards, it's not going to look for just your newly listed one. It'll look, it'll look for your newly listed one. But then the linkage is there now for these ones that you just redid. It makes them newly listed again. Do, do you see what I'm trying to say there? <laughs> That's yeah, got a yeah. long win. Yeah, listing matters. I guess that you probably figure this out I mean in time when you try out different things but I mean <laughs> it seems that you like, are pretty good already well you know I test everything and I keep data data is what made gave me all the edge okay. every single t statistic that you can keep any bit of information that you can store and use that information to learn from later is definitely in your advantage I have actually asked sellers how many of those did you sell? And they had no idea. They told me, oh, well, you know, we had a listing, but we ran out and it ended. So we got more, we relisted it, but I don't really remember what was in that first listing. Well, the minute they tell me that, you know what goes off in my head? Oh, they're going to be out of business in two years. You know why? They don't even know what they sold already. Now, if they don't even know what they sold, how are they going to know what they're going to sell in the future? How are they going to know if that product that they just sold was really profitable? Let's say they sold five Christmas cards. They ran out. They got the same Christmas cards again. They listed 20. They go down. 
They figure out the profit margin on that item that year. They look at the 20. They forgot the five that they had before. And let's say three of those five they had before were returned. Well, they're going to see the data when they file their taxes for the returns. But when they're actually figuring out what they made on that product line, unless they go and look it up later, which nobody does, they're not going to know what those cards actually made them. So when they see them in clearance the next year, They'll say, okay, out of the 20 cards that we had, we sold all 20, and we only had two returns. Gosh, I think I'm going to buy another 20 cards. But they didn't realize the first time they listed, they had three more returns and a complaint and a negative feedback they forgot about. So what's the real picture with those cards that are just about ready to go buy again? It's not as good as they thought because they didn't pay attention to the data. That's why data really matters. <laughs> where, where do you get your data? Do you store it somewhere? in the tools you're I, using? I all down myself. Uh, Hub gives you great data. Uh, I don't know if you have looked at the eBay Hub that is out. Uh, it was one of the best improvements eBay has made in a long time. Uh, it gives you traffic data. It gives you cross comparisons with other sellers. Uh, so for your individual business plan, You've got a little bit of a crutch now if you don't keep accurate records like I do. You can go into the hub on eBay, look at uh, the performance category, uh, look at uh, the growth category. It will tell you which products you have are underselling or underperforming. It'll tell you price comparisons amongst other sellers. Uh, so the, the hub will give you some of the data but it's not going to give you your cost. In other words, the hub will tell you what it, your competitive pricing is. The hub will tell you how many people are looking at it. But it's not going to tell you what you paid for the item. It's not going to tell you how many returns you had. So for that, do you use like Excel sheet or something like that? Yeah. See, that's I don't do that yet. Um, when I go into Shopify, which is coming, by the way, uh, I will have inventory management software. Uh, most of my data will be linked into that in uh, the management software. Uh, I will put my cost of goods sold. I will put my losses, write-offs, all that information in that database. But until then, it's all old-fashioned cards and pens and paper and a calculator. <laughs> <laughs> That's the nice. Format budget. <laughs> uh, just to change the direction a little bit, I'm interested how much do you spend time on on your business during mm. a week? Well, uh, the planet goes around the sun <laughs> and it turns, it takes 24 hours. So pretty much all that time, yeah. All the time. There all is the time. no life other than work. I get up, I'm working. I go to sleep, the phone kitchings, I get up, I'm working. I'm available to my buyers 24-7. If I hear that ka -ching and it's 3 o'clock in the morning and someone goes, I got my item, but you forgot to send one, I am up mailing that item at 3 o'clock in the morning. If I get an email, hey, I really like that robot you just put online. Can you get me more? I'm on the phone with the, car, the, the store that I bought it at, owner. So when they open up, they have that box sitting for me at that front register. And I'm there at 6 o'clock in the morning when they're unlocking the doors. I get that robot. I bring it home. It's mailed to that buyer the second they buy for it, pay for it. Wasn't even listed. So, yes, I work 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Because if you don't Rolls Royce your, your buyers, give them the red carpet treatment, they're not going to come back. Or they might not even buy from you. But trust me, you get up at 3 o'clock in the morning, you go to Walmart and you buy a robot that someone wanted that they needed for a birthday party in five days. They get that item in two days. You know what kind of feedback and how many more sales you're going to make from them and everybody that buyer knows. I get buyers selling my products to their friends, sending me emails. Hey, I remember when you went to the store and you got me this because I wanted it. I have another friend that wants one. Can you get one more? They look at my store the next week. There's 10 available for sale. And then I send them a coupon code for 10% off. And anybody they know. Yeah, that's uh, great customer support we have there. <laughs> well, without that, how am I going to peddle items that I buy in clearance for a dollar 
for $9.99. Nobody's going to pay me $10 for a dollar item unless there's a reason for that. The reason for it is they get it for free, they get it fast, and they can buy several items and actually get it for a good deal. Nice. And that requires customer service. Okay, so we're running at the end, and uh, I see that there are several questions awesome. from our audience, and I'm gonna shoot to those. So there was one question: How do you structure your eBay store to so you can ship everything for free, and is that even worth it? Depends. Uh, I believe in free shipping very strongly, but. Like I said, there's no solid answer for everybody. I sell new products, some inexpensive, some more expensive, but really nothing over really 150 bucks. Okay. Mm -hmm. So free shipping for me is a major pain in the you know what, because there's very little profit on a majority of that cheap stuff. So it's only worth it to me to provide sh free shipping if I can sell more than one. And, I, and so my entire store is designed to get someone to come in and not buy one Christmas card, to buy three packs of Christmas cards or to buy a Christmas card, the clips, and a string of lights. So all of the products I carry have to be able to be purchased in combination. So yes, free shipping is worth it for me because I don't want them to think if I buy three items, my shipping cost is going to go up. If I buy this item, it has free shipping. But this one he has listed as an auction item I have to pay for shipping. And this one he has listed, he's got a reduced priority rate on it. So how much is this really going to cost me? As soon as they delay in their purchase, they don't hit that button. You've got 10 seconds to make that sale. That means from the time they see, from the time they start to look for your item, find your store and click the button, you've got 10 seconds. If they're worried about how much more it's going to cost because they have to add the shipping for this item and that item and that item, that's more than 10 seconds. You're not going to make that sale. Mm -hmm. So in my opinion, for me, now this doesn't work for everybody. Vintage stuff sometimes needs to be paid shipping. Mm -hmm. And if it's an auction, that changes things. But in my opinion, good to cancel, new items need to be like Amazon, you need to not pay for the shipping and they need to have it fast. I upgrade products that should be sent first class often, even though I lose a little bit of money because 50 people might have that. Let's say it's this shirt I'm selling. 50 people might have that same T-shirt sending it first class. I've got mine for a dollar more and they're going to get it in two days. I'll sell 20 shirts before someone else sells one. Now, one dollar and I sell 20 more. Heck, I'll take that loss. So, okay. That's quite a good answer. Shipping matters. So, and we have another question. How on earth do you compete with the additional bricks and mortar? <laughs> well, that's hard. Um, I even get emails sometimes from buyers. I saw your item at Dollar General for $5.99. I paid you $12.99. Well, of course, that's really not very big of a markup. Do the math. But I am always kiss butt. Excuse the language. I write that buyer back. Oh, wonderful that you found a brick and mortar deal. Why don't you just pop that item in an envelope, mail it back to me, and you can run to the store and buy it much cheaper. You know how many items come back? None. Because they realize, oh, well, by the time he paid for shipping in here, he only made a dollar fifty. <laughs> so how do I compete with brick and mortar? Luckily. <laughs> and be and you have to really price low. Uh you can't make profit people are greedy. Okay. I see eBay sellers in ruin, in financial ruin, because they buy something for a dollar. And they want $15 for it because they want to make their three times markup after cost. Well, it sits there and sits there and sits there. It never sells. If someone does buy it, the first thing they do is complain because they know they could have got it at the dollar store. 
Of course they're going to complain. I paid $15 for this flashlight I could have got at the dollar store. Okay, well, yeah, you made your little profit off that one item, but you're probably going to get a neutral or a return or never going to get a repeat buyer. But I'll take that $1 flashlight. Actually, I actually sold those. I sold them for $7.99. Okay. Other sellers were selling them for $14.99. And they were making a few sales. I sold, I think, 100 of those in two weeks. I didn't have any defects. I didn't have any returns. I didn't have one single negative comment. I only had one buyer write and said, I was so glad I got that flashlight in three days. I thought it would take a week. It was marked first class and you sent it to me priority. The reason I sent it to them priority is they bought two other ones. Anytime they buy more than one thing, it's an immediate free upgrade. Now that same buyer has been back over and over again. So that's how you complete with brick and mortar. You have to give them something where it's completely lazy. They don't have to drive to the store. It gets delivered to their house. That's one thing that gives you an advantage. Buyers can be lazy. They can order from you. You're the one that has to go to the store. You're the one that has to check the product to make sure it's not defective. You're the one that has to mail it to their front door. Mm -hmm. So they're paying you to do that. So it is justifiable to raise a dollar item to $10 because you have to provide that item for them. They're paying you for the convenience. So that's how you compete. Also, brick and mortar have limits. We do not, meaning... When you go into a brick and mortar store, those products on the shelf have a date. In other words, if you go into the garden center in the middle of December, you're gonna see plastic to cover air conditioners. You're not gonna see yard figurines or at least a large volume of them. So in the middle of winter, where do you think they go to buy their yard figurines when they live in Florida? or they live in Southern California, or they live in Europe or wherever, because I'm a global seller. Well, they go online because they go to their brick and mortar store and they don't really want an air conditioner cover. They want a statue to stick out in the snowy front yard in the middle of an off season. Well, that gives you an edge over brick and mortar because you're carrying those products that they don't carry all year round. That's why I love Clarence. When brick and mortar is shutting down, let's say all the yard figurines, that's when I'm listing them on eBay. Because that means that everyone shopping out on the brick and mortar world can't find them in the store. If you can't find something in the store, what is the very first place you go look? You go look online. And what happens? I just got mine at 90% off when eBay sellers that were putting them online before the Christmas or before the summer season were paying more than I did for the item. They were putting it online when it was in demand, so they were making more sales immediately, but their return on investment is a fraction of mine, even if I'm selling for less than they are. So my competitive edge is timing. It makes no difference. If it's at a season, hey, that's time to list for me. I look at everything backwards. <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> we could probably discuss more and more, maybe. I'll ask one more last question, awesome. so we wouldn't go like too much. We are already over an hour, so <laughs> so yeah, I'm really enjoying this. How much effort do you put in finding those products? Okay, every day, broke or not, even if I don't have the money to source, I go shopping at the same series of eight stores that I go to. I develop. A, oh, I just made a sale. I, I develop a reputation with the stores that I go to. Uh, as a matter of fact, when I walk into Walmart, they actually have a cashier that follows me around with the scan gun and scans everything in clearance to see if it's eligible for an additional discount. Because they know every time that they scan gun me and I'm in the aisle and they give me an extra 25% off on an item that's already in clearance, I tell the little cashier, take all of them, put them in my cart and go get me another cart. So that is how important sourcing is. You must source daily, broke or not. You must talk to cashiers. You must hear about their kids' little league soccer and pretend you care. I mean, you need to develop a relationship with the places that you're sourcing. It's very important. 
they will tell you what to buy. I had, I've had seller, I've had uh, cashiers say, "Oh, Roger, put those back. They get marked down next week." They're saving me money because you do it every day. So sourcing is the most important. You make your money when you buy that item. Everyone thinks you make your money when you list it. Everyone thinks you make your money when you sell it. Yeah, that's true. But no, when you first buy that item and you get a $10 value for $5 or $4, that's when you've made your money. All right. Yeah, good lessons. I mean, in one hour, we learn probably more about eBay than we could <laughs> do in one week just reading mm -hmm. books or something. So I don't want to take more of your time, Roger. I hope you enjoyed it. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I enjoyed this. I told you I could fill the air. I can talk and talk and talk and talk. <laughs> yeah, so if we have, like, more questions uh, from my community, can I just send you, like, a on Facebook message or... Actually, just make copy and paste every question that you have come in. Send it to me as a private message. I will create a little post and send it back to you. You're more than welcome to put it on your pages. In other uh, words, I will answer the questions that you get and then I'll make it as a post, I'll send it back to you, and then you can post it on your page. All right. That sounds very I great. Oh, I got my coffee, finally. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks for your time, and thank you, everyone, who tuned in for this first Idea Lab. I'm going to create a new discussion group, and I would very welcome your feedback, and if you really enjoyed this or, or not enjoyed this, and if you would want to do this kind of more labs in the future. We'll keep a discussion in the forum. So thank you, Roger, again, and have a great day. <laughs> okay, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.